Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it. Great to have you in on a Tuesday. It's Hale Bar City Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. We will uh, spend a lot of time on Nebraska baseball. A new Husker football commit to tell you about. A tight end from Minnesota, Chase Androff. And uh, Mitch Sherman will join us in 20 minutes. Jacob Padilla. We spent a lot of time talking Husker baseball and football. Big Red Weekend. Uh, Nebraska had some visitors over the weekend. Isaac Trout, one of them. So we'll uh, spend some time with Jacob Bedilla next hour. Rick Kaczynski, Tuesdays with Kaz. So we'll talk with Kaz here in hour two. Numbers to get in, 466-3776-800-825-5865. Email chris at hailvarsity.com and can uh, get us on Twitter. Give us a follow at Schmidt underscore radio, Chris Schmidt at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. And can always follow at Hale Varsity at ESPN Lincoln. So it it was good till it wasn't. It was great until it wasn't last night for Nebraska baseball. And just a, a couple of simple questions to start out. What did you do last night for the game? And what did last night show you about Nebraska baseball? Where the program's at? And uh, what did this team provide you? As a Nebraska fan, four six six three seven seven six. So, uh, before we dive in, I uh, just talked to, to D- cousin Dino's wife Audrey, and just checked in on her, and she gave me the best hint and tip. You, you shave, and uh, there's a little patch under my schnoz that I needed to to clean up. Well, th- I cut my skin below the nose so i've just been bleeding profusely and i walk in and elijah's like dude man how much blow did you do after the loss last night i was like hey i don't do blow b none of your damn business <laughs> so audrey's like yeah you goon uh put an ice cube in some in a towel and hold it for a minute so i'm not bleeding like mike tyson just unloaded on my face anymore but I don't think that was an ice cube. I think that was a, a, a drumstick, like the ice cream. No, that was ice cream. <laughs> it's part of my diet, you rat. <laughs> so, listen, uh, you know, when you're growing up, win or lose, you have some coaches that say, well, let's go get ice cream. Okay? And, and, and Will Bolt's not the type of dude to take kids for ice cream if they lose. I'm not the type of dad to say, let's go get some ice cream. It's okay, Scooter. But... You had a head coach proud of his kids last night. And I think that is pretty uh, representative of of the Nebraska fan base, right? And it, it just, God, it, it, was, it was there. Nebraska jumped out. Uh, you got the, the, the bomb from Roscombe. You had Hallmark able to, to get in that, that, that RBI ground out. And, and you're up 2 nothing, And even through the fifth, right, with Povich, despite Opitz going yard, you're still up 2-1. to one. And then that deadly eighth inning hits. And you, you have trouble finding the strike zone. You have trouble getting a strike call from home plate umpire Mattingly. And then it, then it just unravels. I picked Arkansas last night. That's not a slide at Nebraska. I just figured out, okay... When push comes to shove, who's got the best guy on the field? And the best guy in college baseball is uh, Arkansas's fireman, Kevin Copps. And he went seven innings. He went over 90 pitches. He walked nobody, allowed three hits, and was good enough to get out of some damage, some damaging situations because Nebraska has been pretty good two strike, two out hitting this regional. And Nebraska had a chance 
to uh, to do some magic, and it, it's difficult. It's difficult to get two out RBI. It just is, especially against the number one team in the country. Meanwhile, you fast forward it, and you have three straight rock, three straight walks by by Cody, and and that that sucked. And listen, Nebraska didn't get any help last night from the umpire, and I'll let you take this for a se- in a second, Elijah, because you know you're an umpire, you're not at the college level, but damn, I wish you were. But honestly, with 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 Frank in there and. Where he was at in the zone was he was good enough to get a couple strike calls in that situation. This was all set up by Christian Franklin, the All American center fielder. He's down one, two in the count, and and he was incredible. You look at, at bats, and you foul off four straight pitches, and then, and then get a walk to kind of open the floodgates where there's two more walks, and then here comes Buns. And, and Buns comes in, and there's the wild pitch, and then there's the three-run jack. I mean, good night, game over. You know, Nebraska tried to respond, but it, there, there was just too much cops going on. My main takeaway with Nebraska baseball is this. You, you just you, you love the collection of seniors. I love the, the talent that Darren Erstad recruited. I love the level Will Bolt got these guys to perform at. What do you do with talent if they don't achieve? You waste that talent. Will Bolt did not waste that talent. Will Bolt furthered that talent along with his staff. These kids put the work in, they bought in, and they were for real tough guys in the dugout, on the diamond, in the batter's box. And I think that's why it hurt so much if you're a Nebraska fan last night because you were close, you were there, you jumped out, you had the momentum, it was 2 nothing. But I just felt like when push comes to shove, Arkansas would find a way. And Nebraska proved last night they were, they were one of your top 20, top 16. Hell, we'll see who gets to the College World Series. Nebraska was a good enough team this year. If they're anywhere else, they're in a Super Regional. Nebraska's a good enough team with what they did against number one, pushing them to the wall, that Nebraska could have been a college World Series team this year. I think that's what I realized and saw last night, and you had to see it to, to know because all you had was the Big Ten to go on. So I am, for Nebraska fans, I'm happy for you that you have your program back. And listen, this isn't Texas screaming, hey, we're back, <laughs> beat George after a Sugar Bowl, and then go... 500 or less the, the the following year or don't get to another BCS bowl. No. As long as Will Bolt's wearing that uh, that big red N, Nebraska baseball is going to going to be incredible in the Big 10. Uh they're going to recruit well, they're going to coach well, they're going to play well, and they're not going to shrink in the moment. You see a lot of teams get to a a position they've never been before and it's awful. It's an awful first experience. That was not the case for Nebraska. They have nothing to be ashamed about. They were right there. Arkansas is number one for a reason with their depth and their talent. And let's be honest, you've been missing this from your sports teams you cheer for. You've been missing You've been missing a, your favorite team looking like they've been coached in some instances because when you have so many penalties and missteps in football, it drives you nuts. You also get to see a team that that really does care about what they're doing they want to win they're they're pissed they're mad they're they're bus ride home they're still ticked off because they didn't win they don't want a pat on the head or a pat on the backside they uh, they wanted to win that thing because they're 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 insanely high level comp- competitors but the mental toughness the maturity the focus the talent the ability and then squeezing every drop out of what you have is what you got to see this year, and you saw it against some of the best. Elijah, give me a give me a take umpiring uh, the K zone. I sent you that that was out on Twitter last night, and uh, to Moore and to Opitz, to the, the two consecutive walks after Franklin's walk. There was a couple of strikes in there that didn't get called. Nebraska got squeezed a bit. Nebraska got squeezed a a little bit. And then you make the the one pitch that Buns does make, and it gets launched. 
by the the mother of all pinch hitters. Apparently, he's eight for twelve. So that that was tough. the The strike zone didn't cost Nebraska the game last night, but it just it was horrifically inconsistent in games Nebraska played Arkansas. Two of the three, anyway, in my humble opinion. I mean, you don't need that in that in that setting. Mm-mm. You, two outs in the eighth inning. You had two strikes. Two, two outs, two strikes. And, and then all of a sudden, the inside corner has been called all night. For, at least cops it, got it all night. Well, and and Arkansas was swinging at it. When you look at the the the, the pitches Povich made and got some of the the strike three calls. Don't change your zone. Please don't change your zone. And that, that's not a big ask. It's not a big ask. And then if you're Frank, you're gripping. Because what had been working and it, where your location was when you came in earlier in this regional was fine. Then you got to yes, serve one up if you're Buns trying to get a strike call. Didn't help is, 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 is the obvious point. And I, I was confused last night because I know as an umpire that that spot in the zone right there, you're inside, you're between the they're, catcher and the batter. You're on the plate, aren't they? It's one of the easiest places to, to call balls and strikes is right there because you, you can you see, see the it. ball coming over the, the zone. It's coming pretty much right at your face. You know where it's coming. You, you know if it's a strike or not. And some of those, I mean, I wasn't behind the plate, so I don't want to be too critical but critical criticize away but they look like strikes to me from tv and it looked like cops was getting those those calls in the exact same spot so the difference i think is that i mean the umpire comes into that game knowing who kevin cops is mm-hmm. he comes in that knowing this guy's pitcher of the year if he's trying to hit his spot here he's probably going to hit his spot the umpire knows that coming in does he know nebraska probably not so does that affect what gets called as a ball and a strike? Maybe a little bit. And then I also see that home field crowd. I mean, that umpire, when do you think he's ever umpired in a crowd that raucous? When was the last time? I know he's, he's done some, He's done CWS He's games. done some CWS games, but those don't even get as raucous as Arkansas was last night. After that home run, that was one of the most ridiculous crowd reactions I've ever seen. That was incredible. I'll, I'll give it to the Arkansas fans for at least giving a good environment for their home team. Hmm. They, they've been bad to Nebraska fans, but they gave their home team a home field advantage last night. They did. Well, and and I, I think it, it came to fruition as an umpire. I mean, whenever there's 11,000 people in there cheering whenever you're calling a strike for the home team, you, you want to call a strike for the home team. It's, uh, you, you try to, to try to push that away, but it's still you're still human. And do I think that the balls and strikes made Nebraska lose that game? No. I, I think Kevin Copps on the mound won that game for Arkansas. He won, the, he won the game on Saturday. He won the game on Monday. The difference between these two teams, I think they were pretty evenly matched aside from one player on Arkansas. And he's the best player in the country. And he's the best player in the country. And he went and won Arkansas that regional. So you tip your cap to Kevin Copps and say, we'll, we'll come back better next year. Sure. And and that's it. And Nebraska right there, and you, and you had the announcement today with Schwellenbach, Schwelly's you know, semifinalist for the Golden Spikes Award. Nebraska's Nebraska's got a lot of talent as well, but Schwelly's incredible, and you saw what he did to come in and shut down Arkansas to force a Game 7. Nebraska's best dude out there did his work to get to this point last night. But the buzz, the excitement, that, that old familiar feeling you've longed for as a Nebraska fan – you got it last night, and and you know you can't say enough about Will Bolt. You can't say enough about these seniors: Acker, Hallmark, Roscom, Mojo, Foster, Roach, Hellstrom, Schreiber, Kissick, and and Schwelly. It'll be a first round draft pick, probably heading to the Yankees. Huge shoes to fill, right? But you feel okay about a the recruiting that Nebraska is doing, and b just what some of their young guys did. This season, when they were forced to step up. And I look at a guy like Povich, I love his competitiveness. I love his tenacity. I I love his, well, when he's getting his breaking ball over, his ability to change and then also, you know, kind of wind up and let it fly. He's not, you know, he's not an artist on the corners. He's good at that, but he's got some power with that left arm. I love his style. Uh, I love the fact that Nebraska's got. Uh, options when you look at a, at a dude like uh, Griffin Everett, some of his play this weekend. I look at Cam Chick. I look at a guy like 
the uh, the kid who came in, Bryce Matthews. I think Bryce Matthews can be a hell of a ball player. He's I mean, smooth. He's he smooth. is, and 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 he can hit. And I, I know he didn't have a, a good night last night at the plate, but he's he's a dude that that can play ball. Nebraska has recruited really well, and they're 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 loading up with some arms and some talent to come back and, and go for more next season. And, and where this game last night was a win, it's not a, it's not a win in the, the win-loss category, but it is a win that you can go tell your recruits, look at who led us to this. I mean, a, a freshman led our team in batting average in Max Anderson. You have Bryce Matthews, who was on the all-regional team. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had a young guy transferring in, Cam Wynn, who came in and was all over Twitter last night because of how he was pitching. It, it's young guys that came into this Nebraska team and were the difference between last year and this year. And you can go tell the new guys coming in, even Drew Christo, who's going to be drafted probably pretty high in the draft this year. You can say, hey, man, we're this close. Mm-hmm. And, and we have young guys coming in and filling the shoes and helping us to take that next step. You're part of that. You can go tell the recruits down the road. You're going to be part of this. What's going to get us over the hump against the number one team in the country next time. You're going to bring us to the college. You'll, you'll be in Omaha, right? Mm-hmm. You're in Fayette. You have a chance to, to, to be in games of that magnitude in Fayetteville. Well, Omaha's uh, within eyesight. And then I like Cody and Buns. I mean, I thought they did really well against Michigan, obviously. I thought Cody was fantastic uh, when he came in on, on Friday night. He was just dealing, retired 11 in a row. And I love Buns' performance against Michigan. Poor Buns didn't have a good weekend, per se, but he didn't get a lot of help either. Uh, with the strike zone. We'll get Mitch Sherman's take on this. Huskers fall to Arkansas. Tail Varsity were presented by the Nebraska Lottery. And we're back. Fellas, you think we could listen to the radio? On Hail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! Thanks for spending time. Hail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. We welcome in with the athletic, it's Mitch Sherman at Mitch Sherman on Twitter. Mitch, thanks for the time. How's your Tuesday, man? Hello, Mitch. Hello, can you hear me? I got you now, bud. I don't know if you got me, but I was asking how your t- your, your Tuesday is. You at the pool again? <laughs> you know, Chris, um, I felt like I let you down last week <laughs> because you asked me if I was at the pool, and I was not. Today, I am at the pool. So if you hear any whistles or music or yelling in the background, everything's good. My man, uh, are those whistles at you? <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just laying. Well, I hope not. I'm, just, I'm not doing anything. I'm just laying here. No, I, yeah, see, and Elijah and I was going to get you to hang up on us not, before we even not, talk. Not those kind of whistles. Right, that's what <laughs> I was like, saying. Are, are you getting any whistles, my friend? Okay. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah it's, it's, of course. Always, always, says says Mitch Sherman. Mitch, uh, what did last night show you for Nebraska baseball? A lot of uh, resolve, a lot of toughness. Um, it showed me how close Nebraska baseball is in really just this year one or year one and a half for Will Bolt. Very impressive what he has done in shaping the mentality and the attitude of this team and this program in a short time, and not just the time, but the, the, the kind of time that it's been. It's been nothing nothing like normal in the months since he took over this program, and, and he did have a good base that he inherited from Darren Erstad, but he had to make those guys into the team, into his vision of a team. And, you know, one of the things about college baseball that you know, it makes it similar to other sports, but, but it, it, it is so apparent in June, and it's very difficult to do. I, I don't know that Nebraska ever really mastered this, even in its years of going to the College World Series, is the ability to play your best at the end and play your best at the postseason and have a team that can peak when it, the, it, it is truly crunch time. And, and, and the coaches who can do that are, are the absolute best in the sport who can get their team to that level and you, Augie Garrido had an incredible ability to do that with Texas. Texas would look like a mediocre team in April and May when Nebraska saw them in the Big 12 at times, and then they would roll through the College World Series to a national championship. And, and it is a hard, hard thing to do. And if everybody knew how to do it, then, then you, know, you'd, you'd have, you wouldn't have just eight teams getting to the College World Series. So I, I think Nebraska played its best baseball at the very end, and it, whether it was that, that trip to Bloomington for the quad, before they came home 
and played against Michigan in the in the regular season finale and then going to Arkansas, even without getting great starting pitching all the way through that thing, for Nebraska to just go toe-to-toe with the number one team in the country in front of 11,000 people in a regional atmosphere is, is uh, an amazing feat in, uh, in this, this second year under Will Bolt. And I don't know that – I think it's going to be some time before we really appreciate – how impressive that was to to play that well against Arkansas on its home field. We'll see how how far this Dave Van Horn coach team does. I suspect they're going to be in Omaha, and um, you'll have even more of an appreciation for what Nebraska did. Tell me about the combination here with Nebraska's talent and then Coach Bolt and his staff getting that talent to peak, like you said, but be – be better than advertised. I mean, we we knew they were good, Mitch, but like they're they're they were. As we look back at the end of the year of college baseball, Nebraska will absolutely have made a dent, especially if Arkansas just kind of rolls through the rest of what's in front of them. We'll see if that happens or not. But I mean, I knew Nebraska, I knew Nebraska was good. I liked their talent, but the way they performed was was super special. Yeah, I mean, he, he fostered that environment. Bolt did, and his coaches fostered that environment where those guys were able to grow it with their confidence. And I think that was more of a challenge this year because there was some uncertainty related to uh, the Big Ten schedule. You know, even the players didn't necessarily know how they matched up against teams in other conferences. In a normal season, you're out there playing teams from the Big 12 and maybe the SEC, certainly the Pac-12 and Nebraska's um, history with scheduling in February and March, and, you know, you have a gauge. You have a little bit of a sense, hey, when we get back to the postseason, if we get back to the postseason and we see those kinds of teams again, you know, we can draw on that experience from early in the year and know that we can hit that pitching. You know, we can, we can get those guys out. They had none of that. Every other conference in the country had that knowledge, had that ability, had that confidence. And I think it's the reason that, that other Big Ten teams struggled in the postseason. I know Maryland won a game or two in its region. It's obviously out. And Michigan got, got, got thumped. Uh, at, at Notre Dame. Part of that, I think, is because they didn't get to get out and play anyone outside of the Big Ten, and Nebraska overcame that hurdle and, again, went toe-to-toe with Arkansas. Mm-hmm. So credit to Bolt and his staff and the older players on that team who did have some postseason experience from 2019 to, um, you know, to, build, uh, to build that confidence within the locker room and, and the dugout. Mitch Sherman's with us uh, from The Athletic, at Mitch Sherman on Twitter. He is poolside talking Husker baseball. Mitch, uh, what did you make of Nebraska's experience with balls and strikes this regional, specifically when playing Arkansas? It's not the reason they lost, but, man, it sure didn't feel like it was, uh, it was a helpful uh, zone for the Big Reds pitchers. I saw it in the game when Nebraska walked 10 that the strike zone was inconsistent and it was bad for both teams. And... That's just unfortunate, but it's not necessarily something that gives an edge to. I mean, you, 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 even though Nebraska walked far more than Arkansas in that game, it's important as a pitcher to know what a strike's going to be. And I don't know that the, I don't know that the pitchers or the coaches who were calling the pitches and the catchers had a great idea of what was going to be called the strike in that in that Saturday w- win by Arkansas against Nebraska. Um, and then last night, it was it was okay. Um, I thought until the eighth inning and. You definitely saw Cody Frank and Jake Buns get squeezed uh, when there were two outs and two strikes. And credit to Christian Franklin, the Arkansas center fielder, wow. who had an incredible at bat, um, was nearly out on a foul tip strike three. And you give that guy a little bit of life, you give that team a little bit of life, and you saw what happened. He fouled off four pitches, and he started to shake. Um, he started to shake Frank just a little bit. Finally, draws the walk. And then things unraveled. And it was unfortunate because I felt like things unraveled for the home plate umpire in, in that moment, too. Not to say that Nebraska didn't have control issues. It did. Not every ball was in the strike zone. But the, the 11 straight balls, you know, that takes a toll on a pitching staff mentally and psychologically. And I, I don't know what a strike was in that point. There were several pitches out of those 10 or 11 before the, the, the wild pitch that brought home the winning run where I just could not tell if it was inside, outside, up, down, whatever it was. Um, and, and then Buns was left with no option after the wild pitch but on, on a 2-0 count but to just throw it down the middle, and, and you know he hit out of the park. The Arkansas pinch hitter hit a three-run homer, and that's the game. So um, Kevin Copps obviously had, had a different situation 
where you know he was expanding the zone, he was controlling everything. Just a masterful job on the mound over those last seven innings for, for the Arkansas pitcher. And, and you know he is. Oh, there was a lot of I heard a lot of comments that you know you're not calling it both ways. The Arkansas pitcher had a different zone than the Nebraska pitchers. Yeah, you know some of that's reality, and some of that's just he, that he earned it. You know he, he can expand the zone like like uh, Greg Maddox or, or, or Mariano Rivera uh, did in, in their day, mm-hmm. and that's that's to be expected. Uh, what, what wasn't expected was the way that the, the, the zone disappeared or shrunk with two outs in, in the uh, in the bottom of the eighth for the Nebraska relievers. Yeah, Mitch, I'm with you. The the umpires weren't great, but I think you got to tip your cap to the number one team in the country, Kevin Copps. I mean, he looked like Mariano Rivera last night. Um, but Mitch, as you look at next year, I don't want to go too far ahead here. But what do you think the the trajectory of this team is next year? Is it is it a rebuild season or is it a, is it a reload season? That's kind of the two ways it could go. Well. Um, Let's see if Drew Christo is in uniform, and if he is, uh, that's a big, you know, that's a big, a big bonus. And you know, there's always decisions to be made in the off season around the draft. We know Spencer Schwellenbach is not going to come back, but there are a number of decisions that that, that are going to have to be made about this roster. And and you know, we'll see how the recruits pan out. You know, Kobe Gomez was the guy who was hurt um, in the fall and wasn't even on the the active roster this spring, but's been a big piece for Nebraska in previous years and, and could maybe come back and. Um, I would expect that he would and, and, and help this team. No, I don't think it's – I mean, you rebuild, but, but you're also in, this, in the Big Ten to win it. I don't think Nebraska goes into um, 2022 with expectations to do anything but repeat as Big Ten champs, get back to the postseason and be at home in June. So that, that's, that's it. There's not, there, there is a rebuild because there are older players who are leaving, um, headlined by Schwellenbach, but there are good young players coming into this program. And, and you know, what we're not talking about right now – as Will Bolt and, and, and his staff guided this team through the postseason masterfully, um, is the job that they've done on the recruiting trail also in their time at Nebraska. And a bunch of those guys are going to be showing up to be on that, a part of that 22 team. Mitch, let's uh, spend a second on recruiting and kind of get your takeaways from Friday Night Lights and uh, you know some of the targets Nebraska has for 2022. Pretty big regional feel. Obviously, some guys outside the 500-mile radius, but a, but a different look, so to speak, with where some of the offers are for, for this uh, class as Nebraska tries to get some momentum here this summer. Yeah, it wasn't a star-studded Friday Night Lights. You had Ben Bramer, the 23 tight end commit from Pierce, who I think is a star, is going to be a star, already is a star. I mean, he looks, he looks like uh, Thomas Fedoni out there, and he's two, two years younger. Um, he's already committed in Nebraska. I, I thought he was the best player at Friday Night Lights uh, last week. You know, of the guys who were working out in, in uniform, uh, eight, eight, eight officials on campus last weekend. Uh, the one commit from Chase Androff, another tight end out of Minnesota, who's more of a blocking guy, but definitely has the frame at 6'6 and 230 to be a, a pass catcher in, in this offense and stretch the field like they see with Fedoni and, and Bramer, um, two classes behind. Um, and then some other offers from the private workouts on Friday. No, no commits from that group yet, but uh, Nebraska offered a corner from, from, uh, from Georgia, the state of Georgia after seeing him at Friday Night Lights. And then, again, at the Tallahassee Mega Camp that, that Travis Fisher attended on Saturday. So, but there was a local flavor, for sure, on, on Friday night. Good to see some, some prospects like, uh, like Zane Flores the, the, the moving, moving to be a third-year starter at Gretna as a quarterback. I, you know, I think that um, what he did there and getting in front of some coaches is going to help earn him um, uh, some offers, not necessarily from Nebraska. Uh, we'll see, but um, may- maybe uh, maybe a-, a group of five offer. Um, so, and there are other guys in his situation too. Um, and we should mention uh, uh, Gunnar Gatula, um, the uh, son of, of Southeast coach Ryan Gatula, offensive lineman in the 23 class, got an offer on Friday night at the uh, at the camp from from Scott Frost at the end. So. Um, somebody to watch for sure locally in Lincoln uh, as a potential member of that that class next year. Mitch Sherman with us, uh, some recruiting and some Husker baseball. Mitch, we'll get caught up. Enjoy uh, the sunshine today. Thanks for taking a few minutes. Yeah, good to talk to you. Thanks. All right, there he is, Mitch Sherman. Poolside. We need to ask if that's a daiquiri or just a, a margarita. Maybe neither. Maybe it's just water for Mitch. We'll hit some recruiting next. It's Hale Varsity presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chime in 402-466-ESPN or email the show, chris at halevarsity.com. Just try me. Try me. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. 
20 minutes away, Jacob Padilla going to check in with us, get his take on some uh, football and, and hoops, of course. Nice write-up on what's happening with uh, some of the Nebraska offensive line play. Jacob all over. What's going on with Coach Hoiberg and uh, some of the, the high-level recruits that were also here last weekend and maybe an NBA thought or two. Rick Kaczynski coming up less than an hour. Good stuff from Mitch Sherman. So we've spent a lot of time on Husker baseball. Uh, a few adjectives uh, to go along with this uh, baseball team for 2021. Confident, tough, gritty, sometimes pretty, right? But, uh, you know, coach-like. And uh, it is something you hear so often about taking on the personality of your coach. But, man, the thing that, that Will Bolt does is, is an A, he wins, B, he recruits, but C, he also is that kind of that, that calming presence where when it's hitting the fan, he's got a plan. And that plan is communicated and then executed. And his team responds. And he's only 41. <laughs> so this has been kind of on, on the back burner. But there, there's some reality to worry about with Will Bolt. Not necessarily tomorrow. Not necessarily two weeks from now. Maybe something on the radar after the CWF excuse me, CWS, but people are going to come knocking on Will Bolt's door. And Will Bolt's making 350, 400, something like that. I don't have the exact number, but it ain't half a million. It isn't a million. SEC programs pay their baseball coach a million dollars. The max, the ceiling in the Big Ten's half a million. Now, uh, Lincoln's a great place to grow up. You're familiar with it. Are, is your family happy? That, that There's all those considerations versus being at Texas A&M, going to 16 postseasons in two College World Series and then being shown the door. Okay. There's, there's, there's expectations you have. There's ways to make your boss happy. And then there's, all right, dude, you're not in the College World Series. You haven't won a title. We're, we're shopping. So, Here's a question. Would it, would it shock you to have A&M make a phone call to Will, knowing he just left there? I don't know that Will Bolt wouldn't listen. I don't know that Will Bolt would leave because his mentor and dear friend that he worked for just got shown the door. But if there's another opening in SEC country, and Will's a Texas guy, why wouldn't you make a phone call to him? Eventually, if you're if you're Texas or if you're – Arizona. I mean, think think of some of the who's who baseball programs that will shell out. Now, Nebraska's got resources. Nebraska can pay Will Bolt handsomely, and will pay Will Bolt handsomely. I think Moose is going to take care of him, but you're going to have to take care of him again. And the next guy following Moose, whenever that is, if Will Bolt's still here, or when Will Bolt's still here, we can play both sides of the coin. You better just keep. Signing the guy because you've got you've got one of the best that there is, and yes, we're talking a year and a half in, but he's already kind of proven that to me. I, I don't bat an eye or have no doubt. The other thing too, take care of his assistants because he's got really talented assistants, and I mean they are they are well oiled all together. Christy had uh, I'm not sure if it's Christy or Bolt or who it was, but they had the perfect plan for attacking these Arkansas hitters this weekend. They did. Yeah. You can you can just look at that and say, okay, yeah, we, we got some money coaches at Nebraska right now. <laughs> yes. Like, I mean... Get them a bigger piggy bank. They held one of the highest scoring teams in the country to a total of... Gary the quick one. Math. Was it 14 runs all weekend? Mm-hmm. Across three games? I mean... Because it was 5-2. to two, Then 5-3. to three, and They then, lost. And, and then 6-2. Six, then so six, six, six plus 5 plus 3... 14 runs, yeah. 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 I mean, Arkansas put up 14 runs against one of the best pitchers in the SEC at Ole Miss whenever I was there. I mean... Versus putting up 13 against Ole Miss on a Saturday. Yeah, and then you compare that to Nebraska only putting up four. I mean, this wasn't because... I mean, Nebraska's pitchers had a good weekend, and Schwellenbach, I'm sure, was key to that, Mm -hmm. but 
they had a perfect plan for this Arkansas team. Uh, Will Bolt's great. I mean, he he elevated the guys that Erstad already had here to a level that they weren't playing at under Erstad, and he brought in key freshmen that elevated the rest of the team. I mean, after a year and a half, you can tell this dude's nails. Exactly. I, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. And you're you're getting questions also as to okay, you got the right one, dude, in baseball. Fred could have a really good and competitive season next year with a, a boatload of talent for NBA for 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 PBA. Can football pop? I mean that that's that's what's going on. That's the conversation, and and then all of a sudden we're you know raising our fists and saying awesome work, you know, fist pumping so to speak for baseball, and then you immediately turn to the microscope that is football. And start just thinking out loud, thought bubble. Okay, is is this the year Nebraska football kind of looks like they've been coached and and performs at a high level? Yeah, the, Play their best at the end of the season. It's just that the basketball team and the baseball team have completed what seems to be full rebuilds in the same time that Scott Frost is still stuck at sub five hundred. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's different the argument. Spo- different sport. <laughs> different sport. Different. But, but you have you have two major different men's sausage. teams that. that Two major men's teams that could be in the the top three in their uh, of the Big Ten in their respective sports next year in basketball and in baseball. Basketball needs to have some things go right, but it, it's not unrealistic to say that look at that baseball team next year and say these guys are going to be competing again next year. We're going to ask Jacob that question. What's your projecting? I know we're we're in summer mode right now, but you know, look at what baseball's done. Where do you think basketball goes here in a year? Let's hear from Will Bolt real quick. Couple of comments from him. Uh, we'll get his take on Arkansas in a moment, but I want to get his take here on just overall uh, what his kids did last night and in this regional against Arkansas. Especially after going through a season like this, um, like no other, uh, where we haven't played a road game uh, with more than just a handful of fans in the stands all year long. I felt like our guys, you know, we went toe to toe with one of the best uh, in their ballpark. And, you know, there's, not many environments that are going to be tougher to play in um, in the country than this one. And, uh, yeah, I would say uh, just the heart of this team, what, what they've shown all year long, is they're not going to get rattled by much. Awfully proud of them. More from Will Bolt, what this weekend did. I think you, you can see what the best looks like when you come here. You see, you know, one of the best ballparks in the country. Unbelievable game day atmosphere. Just the way they support this team and, um, you know, obviously how talented – uh, Arkansas is, and um, there's a reason they've won every series in the SEC this year, and uh, SEC champs and SEC tournament champs. I mean, we've seen uh, what the best looks like, um, so that's a good start. Um, our guys have have gotten to the gotten pretty close here uh, to to getting getting to the next level. Got to a regional final for the first time in a lot of, a long number of years. Um, so you know we got to build on it, and uh, you know I think the future is certainly bright, and the seniors. And the upperclassmen have, have laid a pretty pretty solid foundation uh, for what's to come. You know what? That'll be the key. Can you build on it? And I don't have much doubt that they will between recruiting, development, coaching, and then performance. You feel good. You got to feel great about it. If you're a Nebraska baseball fan, as bad as last night sucked to lose after having the lead, and just a case of your national champion favorite making a few more plays. We'll wind down hour one. It's Hale Varsity Radio. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. One final time, Hale Varsity Radio this hour, presented by the Nebraska Lottery, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, and uh, we'll hear a little bit more from Will Bolt in a moment. Coming up, Jacob Padilla, get his take on Husker basketball recruiting. How are some of those in-state and uh, five stars feeling about the Big Red? They were also here this past weekend. And you know what to expect. Can can Husker basketball have a uh, similar type season to what uh, Nebraska baseball and Will Bolt just did? You know, if, if we're going on like confidence rating, you're uber confident about Nebraska baseball, rightfully so. You feel pretty good about Nebraska basketball, and you're still just like, well, let's see where football goes, right? You're just kind of right there. A quick reminder about buckling up. 70% of people in fatal crashes in Nebraska not wearing a seatbelt. If used properly, 
A seatbelt can reduce the risk of fatal injury by up to 60%. Your best defense in any crash buckling up. Brought to you by the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. Fire off an email. Chris at HaleVarsity.com is uh, where you do that. Give us a follow. Find us on Twitter. Chris Schmidt at Schmidt underscore radio. Or at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. Okay. Uh, more from Will Bolt. And uh, let's get his take on Nebraska's pitching and what he thought this weekend. Caden wanted the ball. Felt like we wanted the left-handed arm on the mound. Uh, we wanted to try to stay left-handed if we could. <laughs> With him only throwing, you know, just over 60 pitches on Friday, uh, we knew that that would be a possibility when that happened if we got to Monday. So, uh, yeah, we wanted to give him the ball. I thought he gave us everything he had. He got a little tired there at the end. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a couple of couple innings have gotten away from us this weekend, and that was the difference in two losses, just uh, the walks and wild pitches and, uh, you know, obviously the big swing there at the end. So, Kevin Copps, his importance – what he did last night, he had that Superman cape on. Pretty surprised. Um, I mean, he's – I've never seen anything like it. As long as I've been involved in college baseball, to have a, a guy that is uh, able to go out there and compete at such a high level in such an environment and just on that on this stage and just to, to do it over and over and over again. I mean, there's a reason he's a national pitcher of the year. I mean, the guy is just – he was incredible today. And, I and you know, early on I thought maybe he wasn't quite as sharp um, just from maybe being a little bit tired, but I just felt like he just got better and better as the game went along and – made big pitches and um, you know, I think we had maybe had our shot there to get a two out hit in the fifth inning. Um, he got off the field and, and that was it. Last side here from Will Bolt on Arkansas and I don't know that Dave Van Horn was a huge fan <laughs> and then he voiced that about, you know, Nebraska being a regional matchup, but here's Will Bolt's takeaway on on this Arkansas squad that may be in Omaha. I think they have a great shot. Um, they haven't lost a series all year. You know, they've got a lot of talent, a great coaching staff. You know, they're, they've got everything you need. Uh, they played they play great defense. They, they're athletic. You know, and they're obviously can beat you in a bunch of different ways. So, yeah, they, they've got they got a great team, and I'd love to see Coach win his first national championship. So the uh, longtime player for Dave Van Horn, his support behind Arkansas and uh, Coach Van Horn there, even in defeat, tough one to, to, to swallow for the Big Red, but it's one of those, oh man, moments and grow up games. But uh, you as a Nebraska fan got to be feeling just about the endless possibilities of, of, you know, what's next in a great way for this baseball program. We'll talk some, uh, some hoops recruiting. Jacob Badilla on the way with Hale Varsity Hour 2. Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmidt underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmidt. Great to have you in. Hour two, it's Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska lottery we'll check in with rick kaczynski tuesdays with kaz coming up we'll spend some time a busy weekend on the hardwood as well uh plenty of recruits to talk about jacob padilla in with this from hailvarsity.com and magazine at jacob padilla underscore on twitter jacob how's your tuesday man thanks for the time yeah good i spent it watching high school basketball like i have the last five days so it's on my way back from the uh the lincoln summer league so what are some impressions uh, summer league wise, Jacob? I know you're seeing a bunch of local Lincoln talent and there's, you know, just talking to junior, my boy's going into ninth grade and there's, there's a, a lot of kids that he's seen around or knows of that are underclassmen that are from the Lincoln region, you know, that, that are going to wow folks. And you've had a chance to see some, some pretty high level summer teams, haven't you? Yeah. Um, it's, Speaking of that 2025 class, like, man, just thinking about that number <laughs> makes me feel old. But uh, <laughs> you and, <laughs> and look out for the name Chuck Love. Uh, the, he is uh, the son of the uh, Nebraska women's basketball assistant, Chuck Love. Um, he, uh, he's going in. He's going to be a freshman at Lincoln Southwest. And I, I saw I've seen him play a handful of times 
over the weekend and into today. And that kid can shoot the lights out. He's long, about 6'4", six, 6'5", six, already. Um, and he's shooting like 60, 70% from three in, in the games that I've seen. So um, in, every time I see him, it's, he's doing a little bit more, just kind of getting a little bit more comfortable. So he's a kid that is going to play right away for Lincoln Southwest, I think. And that's a team that's got a lot of veterans coming back. So the fact that he's already a, kind of a key part of their rotation speaks highly to um, how talented he is. You know, and I look at Southwest squad, and we saw them a lot last year. I mean, Hunzecker and uh, Rylan Smith. And, Ry- Rylan and, and then the, and the, the senior shooting guard. And Jared Bohr transferred yeah. to Lincoln Pius. Yeah. Oh, did he? I didn't know that that did, was yeah. in the works. Thank you for that little note. <laughs> But yeah, Ryland so, Smith's money and, and Hunzecker, and then you get you, you get Chuckster in there. Yeah, that'll be yeah. that'll be cool at the old nest. And with a name like Chuck Love, just give him a give him a mustache, and you can have a backup career doing something else. Well, and, and, and or just say, look, man, it's it's nil time, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so that's pretty good, Jacob. Yeah, and so yeah, there's just a lot of good young players out there. I think Southwest, in particular. Uh, uh, Hunziker and Smith are both kind of coming off some injuries right now, so they're given a chance to give some other guys. Bon Boom, who uh, his older brother is playing Emporia State. Southwest is playing a lot. Lucas Helms, who banked in a game winner today um, uh, at, at the buzzer, just barely got it off. Uh, he's been playing a lot for them and kind of running the point a little bit at, at 6'5", kind of a creative scorer. So that, that's kind of the cool part about June basketball is, um, you get to see a lot of different guys that are kind of trying to step up and figure out um, what they can do, kind of what role they can step into next year after maybe playing a smaller role previously. Yeah. Jacob, I want to turn our attention to Nebraska. Huge weekend for Coach Hoiberg and the crew. And uh, let's let's spend some time on Isaac Trout. I know we talk about Isaac when you're on with this, but you had a chance to get caught up with him and – you know, how are things with Isaac and Nebraska? How did this weekend uh, kind of move the needle, if it moved the needle? Yeah, I, I think uh, just talking to him, it sounded like he really did enjoy it. They, they had a, a packed weekend um, and really got to spend a lot of time with the coaches, with the players. And that's going to be the biggest key, I think, for this, this string of official visits for Isaac because he's, uh, he's communicated with all these coaches virtually over the past year, year and a half or so. Uh, but now he's getting a chance to actually be around them. And he even said himself, sometimes coaches can be a little different in person than they are on the phone, on Zoom or whatever. And uh, he said Fred Hoiberg was not like that. He was just kind of the same guy that he, he, feel like, he feels like that he's been interacting with over the past year that has been recruiting him. So um, I think that was a big part. And it, just talking to him, it, it really does sound like it's just going to be a feel thing for him as far as, all right, who – which coach does he really hit it off with the most? Where does he really see him himself fitting? Um, I don't think I think he's completely open to staying home or leaving and checking out. I don't necessarily know that he's kind of set one way or the other about like, yeah, I definitely want to get out of here. Yeah, it would be great to stay home. I think it's he's kind of going into this with a completely open mind and is just trying to uh, get a feel for all, all these coaches uh, and particularly the head coaches uh, of all these programs. When we talk about Trout and, and his skill set, you know, another thing that was advertised is, is Hoiberg's five out offense. You, you got a guy like Welcher that was in and uh, helping his brother move in, kind of an, un, an unofficial visit for Welcher. Uh, he's uh, a guy on Nebraska's radar and everybody else's radar. You know, what, what, what kind of pitch and appeal? do you think Fred has? I mean, he's got a good roster. They're competitive. And it seems like a fun offense with a former NBA guy. I mean, that sounds like a really good recipe here. Does that translate, in your opinion, to uh, to greater success going into year three? And I ask that kind of on the heels of, I know basketball and baseball are different, Jacob, but baseball's you know had a wow factor going on here this season with Will Bolt, and look look where Nebraska baseball went in a short time. Do you feel like Nebraska basketball's in position to, to maybe take off next year? Yeah, I think this this 
season is big for so many reasons. And I, part of it is that recruiting pitch that he's giving out to these players. Um, uh, and I think he's got it. One, they, they, have, they got to win some games this year, obviously. It goes without saying. But um, he's, I think with the continuity that he has coming back, in addition with the talented young players, he's really going to get a chance to kind of show off his ability as a talent developer and as a guy who can create pro, can build up pros. And um, like talk with Isaac, kind of part of the pitch for, for Hoiberg, him specifically, was that obviously the fit, um, he, he's a great fit for what he wants to do, and it's an NBA-type system and all that. But uh, Fred's also the guy that works hands-on with these guys a, as a shooting coach. And he, he feels like, hey, if, if I can uh, kind of polish up and tighten up some things on your jumper, like that, that'll be your key to getting to the NBA. Um, he thinks like he, he's got the potential to – to be a really good player, and if you kind of iron down that jump shot and turn himself into a consistent 40-plus percent shooter, um, that he'll have a great shot at making a lot of money playing this game. So um, I think that's, that's part of the pitch, too. So this year, with the guys coming back, with the obviously Bryce McGowan's coming in as a five-star talent and all that kind of stuff, Horberg will get a chance to kind of show, all right, how do you develop talent at Nebraska? Can you put guys into the pros from Lincoln? Jacob, I'm going to need you to tell me a little bit about Omaha Baloo because he was on his uh, his visit this weekend to Nebraska, and I went and watched some highlight videos last night, and the dude just dunks on everybody. So I don't have a good feel for his game because his highlight tape is just him power-stepping in the lane and dunking on some 6'4", poor high school junior. So, so tell me a little about him. How would his game translate to Nebraska, and what is Hoiberg's recruiting pitch to him? Uh, and he's uh, about 6'8". He's got a good frame. Um, I think he can continue to add muscle, add, add, add strength. Um, and he's a guy that's got kind of a good mix of, obviously, the size and then some skill. He's got the ability to put the ball on the deck a little bit, to get out and lead the break. Um, he, he, I think he, he wants to be able to step out and shoot a little bit as he continues to develop. Um, so he's just kind of a guy that's got a lot of potential to develop into an all-around player. And obviously those are the kind of guys that do really well that Hoiberg is looking for, guys that can – maybe um, defend big, but then step out and play on the perimeter on the other end. Um, so that, that's kind of what Blue, the type of player that he is, um, he, he's got a chance to really develop into a special player as he continues to kind of refine the skills and uh, develop uh, physically uh, and in his game. Jacob, is, is Coach Hoiberg with his reputation – I don't think his reputation's an issue at all when it comes to, to getting guys to the NBA. He's done that where he's been, and he's been in the NBA. But when it comes to Nebraska's reputation and perception, is that a battle for Hoiberg, or is that is that wall kind of coming down that, all right, you, 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 you will be able to get to the, to the pros and make a living off of what you want to do, what you love, that's basketball, by going to Nebraska, is that is that something that is is getting re reinforced by Fred, or is that a wall he's got to knock down because of you know Nebraska's perceived rep around the basketball circles? Is the rep getting better? Yeah, and that's I think that's why I uh, said the season is so big because he does have back to back seven win seasons in Lincoln. Yeah, he's got all, all his time at Iowa State and has shown what he's capable of, but he hasn't shown he can do it in Lincoln yet. And so that's why I think this year is so big that you can, you can bring a five-star into the program like Bryce McGowan, and if he can kind of live up to the hype and uh, really thrive in your system, and whether one and done, two and done, uh, whatever, kind of once this time's done in Lincoln, um, ends up being a draft pick. Um, I think that's kind of what we're looking at here is like, we, you you got to add the proof of concept to be able to kind of battle some of that negative recruiting and kind of battle, not even negative recruiting, just kind of the impression. Like you mentioned, Nebraska basketball um, it, it doesn't have the same ring to it as a lot of other programs that they're competing with for talent. So um, I think he is still probably battling that a little bit. Uh, but also I think um, they're, they've done a great job of kind of re- refining that pitch and like being able to sell Fred Hoiberg 
himself and showing that, hey, we're on our track to doing the same thing in Lincoln that he did in Ames. Jacob Adilla is with us, HaleVarsity.com and Magazine. Great stuff on Nebraska basketball on high school hoops. The name Chuck Love to remember as a super talented freshman in high school uh, for Southwest. Jacob, I, I love your film study sessions. And, you know, what were you able to kind of glean earlier this week when you sat down and studied Turner Corcoran? Yeah, when I uh, decided to uh, folk really hone in on his pass blocking uh, snaps against Rutgers in, in that first full start. Um, and I, I was pretty, I, honestly, I did not really see him um, getting beat, like just straight up in, in a pass block rep, really. There was one or two um, kind of plays that weren't necessarily drop back passes where um, he struggled a little bit on. I think he's got to continue to get stronger and uh, more comfortable in his movement. Uh, there was kind of, that's kind of where he struggled a little bit, where he was pulling uh, and he struggled to get to the place where he needed to make the contact with his block. Or as he's sliding, he got knocked backwards and didn't have his balance set. Um, so I think that kind of that when you're asking him to pull around and make plays at the second level, that's kind of where I think he needs to continue to improve. But just in terms of blocking, in terms of um, he, he handled a stunt they threw at him really well. Um, there are a couple of reps where he uh, either stonewalled the guy or knocked him back a, a couple of yards. So, um, all in all, I, I was really uh, impressed by what I saw for him, just, just to be a, a true freshman out there and heck, just not even messing up, really. like that, that in itself says a lot about him in his first start. And I think there's a lot – Lot to build on. Obviously, it was just one game, and um, Rutgers isn't the the best defense in in the Big Ten, but um, certainly something that I think was encouraging to the coaches to be able to build off of. Jacob, the Suns in in how many over Denver? <laughs> uh, I, I think Jokic is going to get at least one or two, but I'll go Suns in six. Kind of kind of roll this forward. Okay. Do you have a, a prediction here with uh, Atlanta and Philly? I. I have not seen a single second of that series yet, so obviously it's not. It did not go well for Philly in Game One, but we'll see what kind of adjustments Doc Rivers can come up with here in this next game. But Ty Lue in L.A. man, uh, Clips. Uh, well, well, Ty Ty Lue's really good in elimination games with the, the one seed weight. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and now Utah's going to be without Colorado uh, with uh, without Mike Conley in yeah. the first game, which is oh, brutal. Got, got a little bit of a break there, so. We'll, we'll kind of see what Conley can do, kind of how long he'll be out, what he'll look like uh, if he's able to get back out there for game two or beyond. But um, we'll, we'll see. I mean, it hasn't been pretty for the Clippers, but they got it done, and now they'll have a chance to kind of keep, uh, keep it rolling here in round two. And it really feels like there's four teams in the West that could realistically make it to the Western Conference Finals, and then once you make it there, uh, you could obviously make it to the Finals. So who is you, who are you leaning towards uh, on being your NBA Finals team from the West if you take that Suns fan hat off? <laughs> well, I mean, Doesn't come uh, off. <laughs> <laughs> I, honestly, I, the Suns have as good of a chance as I think anybody out there. Obviously, the Clippers have not looked like kind of what they were hoping to be um, in terms of uh, when they put this team together. There's some flaws on that team. Um, Lakers already done, obviously, so that was kind of the other team that you kind of felt like was uh, kind of had the advantage on the rest of the field just because of that LeBron Davis combo. So I think Utah, Phoenix, uh, Clip, like all these teams, I think are on a pretty even playing field. And um, it's going to be I, compared to the East where. I think at this point, based on what we've seen from those four teams and the health and everything, uh, they, they, even without Harden, you feel a lot better about Brooklyn's chances and everybody else at this point. I think in the West, it's going to be pretty wild. Jacob, we'll let you get on. We'll, we'll check in next week and awesome stuff. Thanks for taking a few minutes with us. All right. Sounds good. Take care. There he is, Jacob Padilla with us. Good stuff around the, uh, the old... Uh, three-point arc there great stuff from jacob we'll dive into some uh some football and even some husker baseball the the Cavs man is on the way rick kaczynski's next to tail of our city presented by the nebraska lottery and we're back fellas you think we could listen to the radio listen? on hail varsity radio presented by the nebraska lottery yes that's awesome 
Back into it at Tail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. We say hi to Rick Kaczynski, coach at Nebraska and Iowa. Tuesdays with Kaz. Kaz, what do you know? I don't know a whole lot, according to all the people that work for me and my wife. So, you know, but uh, no, uh, I know that uh, was a heck of a season for the old Husker baseball team. Enjoyed watching that as a fan. It was uh, was cool rooting for it, man. You got Notre Dame and Nebraska. Uh, you know, making some noise in baseball, so it was kind of cool. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the eighth inning, eighth inning happened, but man, they went toe to toe. With, hey, that's baseball, but uh, mm. it was fun, fun watching. You know, it it was really cool because you had that that joy and expectation, the drama. I mean, so much, right? Uh, hinging on every pitch. And growing up, I used to love going to baseball games and then taking the old family vacation either down to Kansas City or Wrigley or later on out to Colorado and just being in person's you know how you love doing it but either watching your kids or watching uh, your favorite team is is just great and it was it was heartbreak last night but man Kaz Nebraska showed they belonged, uh, you know, above and beyond. And I'm not a moral victory guy. I know you're not a moral victory guy either, but there's some uncertainty with just, you know, how for real uh, would a team out of the Big Ten be? And that's not a knock on Nebraska. It's just you just had conference only, right, because of the, the, the league. Well, I tell you what, Will Bolt did an amazing job. And I think as a coach, you probably had to smile about what you saw. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah, the Big Ten didn't do him any favors, so you're you're always wondering how well you're going to do on a on a big stage. And and I know there was um, a little bit of pushback when the regions came out and where Nebraska was going to go and who they had to play. And I, I go, you know, I guarantee Coach Bolt and the players said, "Yeah, bring it on." I mean, you got to look at that. Hey, this is a great challenge. Mm-hmm. It's a great opportunity, and that's how it turned out. Um, I love Coach Bolt. I love how his players respond. And only a, only a team that's coached, all right, that put in those positions of adversity. The only way, you can't simulate a game in practice, all right, but what you can do is put pressure on players. What you can do is hold guys accountable on every single pitch, every single ground ball, every single fly, um, um, fly ball, every single – base being run every decision that's made you can put that type of pressure and that's what you see you see a team what i saw on a team what's great as a coach and a fan is you saw a team that the coaches the staff put those guys in position to be successful it wasn't on game day it was in their in their preparation nebraska went in there thinking they could win that game and Nebraska went in there, and they weren't going to be bullied, and they were tough. They fought through adversity. It was a great representation not only of the baseball program, but, um, you know, when I when I watch Notre Dame, mm. you know, there's been times where um, I've been a fan, and there's been times where I've watched them. I didn't feel like they represented the university that I went to and played football for. Right, um, I can say that now. When I'm a big fan, is when those guys look like I think they should look like. And when you watch Nebraska baseball, what I saw yesterday is that's how Nebraska, the state, the people, the university, the athletic department wants to be represented. Obviously, hey, they, they didn't win, and I, I ain't. Wor- I'm not worried about that. It's it's how they played the game. Uh, it's the emotion, the guys playing together, the dealing with the adversity, coming back, not flinching, man. I mean, that's that's what you just love, and I mean that that needs to get that needs to get across to all the programs, you know, i.e., football, basketball, and you know, there are some tough dudes on that baseball team. There were some tough dudes on that mound. There's some tough dudes at that plate. Some tough dudes in the field, and some tough dudes in the locker room. And, you know, they didn't flinch, and that's what you got to get to. That's what you got to get to in all the other sports in Nebraska, man. But I, I, I tell you, it was great for me. I was a, I was a fan. It was it was funny, man. I, I was online last night before the game started. I said, hey, you know what? I got to get me a Nebraska baseball tee. So, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, you take me to, you know, 
maybe you can pay me in a Nebraska base, base, baseball tee for uh, Tuesdays, Tuesdays with Cash. I, I will not only get you a, a Nebraska baseball T-shirt. I, Kaz, I don't know that you're a jersey guy, as in like you would wear a jersey. <laughs> I mean, you, not me, bro. I'm no. way too cool. I'm no, way I too cool to be wearing it. And I, 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 my biceps are... Uh, you, 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 to, to pull the... To, to pull, I mean, let's be honest, okay? I mean, let, let's just call it one. <laughs> to be a middle-aged white guy, it's really, really tough to pull. You, the, you're not pulling it off, bro. You just no, not. Well, exactly. Not. Just there's, not. There's, Nobody's there's, pulling the jersey off. There's Nobody's an expiration the date. Jersey. There's an expiration date on when you can wear a jersey. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I have one jersey that I think I wore maybe once in my life. It's a it's a LK line Tiger home jersey. I wore it and then I kind of like caught myself walking out the house in a mirror and I think I took it off. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? I mean, I look like a clown without the makeup. So went in the closet and. Uh, <laughs> It's still, it's still there, so it's it's made about four moves with me. I think it's still on the same hanger, but yeah, you won't uh, you won't you know. Hey, let's be honest. You know, as a coach and as a player, I'm not buying a whole lot of gear, Schmidt Rock. You know, no, I'm, you've still, gotta, I'm still I wear free gear. You're I, good. I don't care what school. I'm, I'm you know I'm I'm a fan of any school. You know, I got Texas gear. I got North Carolina gear. North. Uh, Notre Dame gear, Vandy gear, you name it, man. We're all my buddies, coach. I'm a, I'm a fan of when they send me gear. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, we're cheap. When you get stuff for free for so long, it's hard going to uh, the sporting goods. It's hard going to Shields and saying, man, I'm not I'm not paying 110 bucks for for a pair of running shoes. Yeah. Hey, Jay Terry. Just, G- give me hell? some Adidas, brother. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jay, how come I only got three pairs in my locker and Barney has four? That's BS, you know? <laughs> and, and the poor equipment dude's like, yeah, okay, what size? Uh, 14? Okay, well, we'll get it handled. No, I didn't think you were Jersey guy. The K-Line Jersey fits i thought maybe you were fidrich but <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i tell you know you know my my, my years you know i kind of, you know obviously the 80 you know well, yeah, trammel well. sweet lube chet lemon i mean you know the, it's maybe you're going because... sparky maybe you're just going with a sparky jersey yeah Mark. you know Billy Martin was a was the manager there too, right? I I, I mean, knew that that I, I yeah. remember Billy Martin obviously getting fired every other day by by Steinbrenner. I remember him with, and I wasn't old enough, but I watched enough this week in baseball as a kid to to know that uh, that, that uh, right that was the greatest. So you had you had that was footage the... of uh, of um, of the, the 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 crazy A's right in the early seventies with Reggie. And yep. and then I knew he was with the Rangers uh, when it comes to 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 his stops. But no, I didn't know. I didn't know Billy was with Detroit. When was he there? Oh gosh, I, I t- he had to. Well, he had to be before Sparky and in between the uh, so post Cincinnati uh, pre Detroit yeah, years. But he, yeah, was, he was with the Yankees though in the late seventies. Yeah. Mid yeah. So it must have been early set after Mayo Smith. Mayo Smith was there with the six. 68 probably or, you know, when they won or when they won the series in 60 67 um 68 and, and uh gosh must have been must have been right after that i'm assuming but yeah i kind of obviously grew up with that you know hearing hearing people talk about that 68 sure, team and yeah. then and then you know i mean heck i mean you think about some of the players on the uh on the 84 team and, and, i mean you've got gibson lance Parrish. You know, Chet, well, I, mean, I mean, Trammell, Whitaker. I mean, Trammell and Whitaker played together 19 seasons. I'll I mean, find you a, a, a Cecil Fielder or, or a Gibby jersey, and we'll see if you pull it off at the beach someday. Uh, no, I'll, I'll get you I'll get going, you some Nebraska gear. I remember going gear. to McDonald's as a kid and seeing Cecil Fielder cut out, like holding a Big Mac. No no lie. No <laughs> lie. So, I was, <laughs> Mount Cecil, I love it. Rick Kaczynski is with us, Hale Varsity Radio. We took a right turn uh, when it comes to uh, Nebraska. Kaz, I'll get you a Husker T-shirt, or I'll get you a lid, or I'll get you both. That'll be, that'll be, that'll be correspondence. Husker baseball wrestling. Husker okay. wrestling. Well, we can call him, baseball. We can call Coach Manning. Manning will hook you up. Yeah, we'll get, Manning's my guy. I love Just, Manning. Yeah, he's Manning's the best. my dude. He's 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 slightly a little bit crazier than me but and i'm a little crazy and he's he's 
he takes it on the next way. But what about the job he's done? He's I incredible. Mean, yes, unbelievable what that guy's done for not just not just for Nebraska, but for the sport of wrestling. He's just unbelievable, unbelievable dude, man. You see him, tell him, Cav said, "What's up." I'll shoot him a text. we got to get Kaz and, and Coach Manning in studio together next time you're down this way. Rick Kaczynski's oh. with us. That'd be fun. Kaz, uh, real quick. So Robert Kraft got gifted uh, a, a special uh, vehicle. Uh, Kraft, uh, for his 80th birthday, got a Bentley. So when Kaz turns 80, what, what muscle car do you want gifted to you? Well, I hope Kaz gets to eighty, right? <laughs> well, um, we I want we all want to see which is which. I don't. Know, I wouldn't wait. Wait, Kaz has lived. I don't know if I'd hedge that, but uh, <laughs> 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 but it, by the time I'm there, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll be in luxury, something luxury. I'll be out of the muscle car. Just get me. Uh, you want you a know, caddy me or a Lincoln or what? I'm more of a Lincoln guy. I'm, I'm more of a Lincoln. I, I've, I've had, I, I like the Lincolns, man. Uh, you know, my grandfather worked at Ford in the 60s. And, um, yeah, I kind of, uh, you know, grew up a Ford guy, I guess. So, like the Lincolns. like the Lincolns. I'm a fan of the Lincoln. But uh, we'll see. Who knows? You know, keep Biden in office a few more years. You might not be able to drive cars here anymore. So, we'll see. We'll see, Schmidt Rock. <laughs> what, not what's to make that? it political here. No, you, you do you, man. That's all good. You uh, you tell me, though, what, what Lincoln do you want? Do you want one of those early 80s models that were giant and comfortable? Oh, no, 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 no. New, new, bro. New, <laughs> new, no. I want it by then. Hopefully, I got a Lincoln that serves me drinks. Okay, so and, drives and itself so and serves you drinks. I yeah, gotcha. yeah. I want something big that reclines with seats that, uh, like, on a leather couch. I mean, okay. At Link, Lincoln's are classy, bro. No, I don't want anything old. I don't want anything from the eighties. I want, you know, when I'm eighty, I want how old was I? When will that be? Schmidt Rock, help me with the math. But uh, yeah, we'll be closing in on uh, a ways. We'll be closing in a ways. So <laughs> you know, hopefully by then. Uh, you know, I'll be driving a driving a new Lincoln. Well, keep on that uh, that Lincoln wish list there. Rick Kaczynski with us Tuesdays with Kaz Hale Bar City Radio. We'll dive into the college football playoff. Do you jump to twelve? Well, we'll see what Kaz has to say about that. Uh, the text message is out to Coach Manning for wrestling gear for Kaz. And we'll have to effort some baseball gear. More with Kaz, coming up, Hale Varsity. We're presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Back in Hale Varsity Radio, more with Rick Kaczynski, Coach Kaz, as we dive into the postseason thought. Playoffs could expand. Kaz, I want to talk college football playoff. Uh, next three weeks will determine what 2022 looks like if the uh, college football playoff uh, expands to. Not eight, but 12. That's the momentum right now, according to Yahoo, where you'd get six automatic qualifiers, your conference champs. You'd get uh, your your highest-ranked group of five, and then you'd have six at-larges, and this could help wrap up a, a monster renegotiation for a TV deal. Do you like four? Do you like eight? Do you like six? Do you like the old bowl system, or do you think 12 sounds good? I just think 12 might be a... Yeah, it might be over their skis. It might be a little bit too quick. There'd be four first-round buys. Your top four would get a buy. Yeah, I guess one, I just don't know enough about it. I'd have to read. You know, I haven't been paying attention to it. No matter what, you could have you could have 16, and, and somebody's going to um, be left out, right? But that's the great thing about college football and playoffs and seeds, you know, is uh, the conversation. My only concern about it, once you start going to 12, things like that, you're, what you're coming up to here pretty soon, in my opinion, you're going to start seeing these, you know, like a four division, just major, major conferences. I just, I just feel like that's the way that, uh, that the sport's going and start talking TV and money and all that. Gosh, you just, when it comes to that, usually the, the wrong decisions are made. I obviously grew up in the old bowl. There, I don't think there is a perfect, a perfect system. I love the pageantry of the bowls. I love all that. I'd have to take a look, Schmidt, and just kind of see how, how they're going to do it. But obviously, if you look at the last three, four years and the co- with the college football, I think the, the bowl season has been uh, extremely diminished anyway. So if this is the time to do it, let's go ahead and do it. You're going from 4 to 12. Ooh, that's a uh, – man. 
That's that's a jump. So you that's got a, that's you, a that's a big jump. You got to get the Rose Bowl to play ball with some flexibility. You got your New Year's Day sixes that are pretty high level anyway, right? That you're you're trying to get to is as either a, a conference champ that may have one too many losses right now, or your runner up, and your yes. conference title games would be kind of your play in to that college football playoff. In some leagues, like the SEC, or, or in in some years, the Big Ten would would get a second team in with that at large you'd be able to fill it out you had enough good bowl games still and locations where the bowl the bowl games would kind of fill in the void if you do expand it and then obviously you're going to have your two semifinal sites in your national title venue yeah i think if you do that uh you know you have a formula like that i think you keep you keep the interest in the bowls not and i'm not talking the fans i'm, I'm talking the players too because mm-hmm. what we've seen over the years since christian mccaffrey uh, you know, it's been okay for for guys not to play in the bowl games. And, you know, the NFL, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you know, you'd get penalized in the draft mm-hmm. by the NFL for taking a game off or doing things like that. But, you know, that climate and that culture's changed. And, you know, I'm not saying McCaffrey made the wrong decision. Mm-hmm. I mean, to each his own. And um, But I think – it, uh, I think you're going to have teams feeling and players still feeling like they're going to play for something. And, and also, I think what you're going to get, it's going to replace those, um, all due respect to the Bethune Cookmans and all that, you know, kind of those, uh, those warm up games in the beginning mm-hmm. of the year. Sure. I mean, anything that creates stimulation and interest and, you know, cross country uh, games and cross section of conference games. Uh, and I think now's the time that college college sports needs that needs that injection, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think they go through this probably about every twenty twenty five twenty five years. You probably need something. You probably need something like that right now, because with all the the conferences changing, uh, you know the the outliers, the you know Texas A and M and the SEC, West Virginia and the it's really be kind of come like the NFL, mm-hmm. where you have you have four big conferences, and I think that's kind of where we're going. And it's almost turning into a playoff. It's going to turn into a playoff system, where I think maybe then you get it gets back to where you feel like more than the top three or four teams have a chance mm-hmm. to win playing for a national championship, or you know coming up on matchups and things like that. So. So, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, basically I'm hearing it from you, the mm-hmm. formula for the first time, and I think it's a, it sounds like a pretty good deal. But, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm old school, but, hey, you know, you got to, I can't, you know, dinosaurs got to change. So, uh, you know, <laughs> we got we to gotta change, and this is probably the time to do it. You know, the, the, we, we go back to, to some of the late 80s, early 90s moments in college football where, you didn't have Penn State get to play Nebraska. Nebraska didn't get to play Notre Dame just because of, of some of the bull ties with the Pac-12 and the in the Big Ten at the time. Nebraska was always tight in the Orange Bowl. Notre Dame able to go kind of wherever you wanted for the best matchup. And, you know, it could have settled a lot of things if we, if we jump in the DeLorean and have a little bit more freedom. This sounds okay to me. What I want to keep have happening, though, is those incredible, you know, week three monster non-conference games where you have Nebraska, Oklahoma, or you have USC, Notre Dame, or you have Miami, Alabama, or Notre Dame, uh, Wisconsin. I, I want to keep seeing those as kind of your barometer ball games against uh, another top 25, top 10 foe. Yeah, and I think you'll have those early until – until it starts penalizing your chances yeah. to make the playoff, to become one of those 12 or 16 or 8 or how many they're going to do. I think, I think that's, that's part of it. So, uh, so you know, I, I think you'll have those early on, but eventually that might, that, that might change. Mm. Um, you know, but once again, it's going to come down to the formula and, you know, how teams are penalized. If they start penalizing teams or they look at strength of schedule, if those type of things matter, then, you know, you're going to keep those, keep those marquee matchups. But, you know, Shmi, we're from a different time. Um, you know, it's really hard to view through the lens of these kids that grew up in a, 
different state of college football than mm-hmm. we did. Um, you know, we, uh, I, I still think there's pageantry there, but the pageantry is just, it's become more like the, the NFL where you kind of root, root for your team. I, I don't think you have that deep hatred of the rivals with all the conference realignment and all those things, and which it's bad for guys like you and I and uh, us old guys that grew up in a different era. But, you know, for these kids that don't know any better, that what, what they've seen, hey, this is a chance for my team to make it. It's a chance for my team, other, you know, a team other than Clemson, Ohio State, uh, or Alabama to be there every year. So, uh, so I think I think college football needs to do something to because I think I think people are getting tiresome uh, of seeing the same four, six, eight teams in the in the same conference. Quite frankly, yeah. winning the national championship and in the playoffs every year. So, so I think that's uh, I think it's probably a good thing as much as we hate to see it, but it's probably it's probably good for the for the sport overall. Rick Kaczynski's with us Tuesdays with Kaz. Kaz, I'm going to get on the horn with Coach Manning, and I will. Uh, my, my goal this week is to find you a wrestling shirt and a baseball shirt, non-jersey. There you go. I will not send you a yeah. singlet. I will not send you a baseball jersey. <laughs> please, please don't. Please don't. <laughs> Even in my prime, I couldn't get away. I couldn't get away with uh, sporting a jersey. <laughs> Coach, Coach Rick Kaczynski. Coach, be good. Thanks for the time today. You got it, buddy. Let's see you soon, right? Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. We'll continue our discussion on this college football playoff, a busy next couple weeks or so with some of the powers that be in the NCAA and the chancellors and presidents moving towards a playoff. We'll dive into that with Brad Edwards tomorrow a little bit further. But is is 12 too few? Or are you good with 16? Are you good with 8? Something to sleep on. 4 is maybe not doing it for you anymore. Maybe 4 is fine. Tis June. Tis the season to talk off-season in college football. Elijah, what I think's going on is you've got still pretty decent ratings, but you've got a, a high level of Bama fatigue. And guess what? They ain't going anywhere with Saban re up and be, uh, be in Tuscaloosa another seven years. Dabo's still young at 50 or 51. And we'll see who else makes that jump. Ohio State isn't going anywhere. So is it Oklahoma or somebody from the Pac 12 that emerges? Is Texas or Georgia? Is somebody else from the Big Ten West going to make a move? Could it be Iowa? Could it be Wisconsin? Is Nebraska set to have a breakthrough next season and then keep building? I mean, there, there, there's, a, there's a lot out there. You really don't. Notre Dame, obviously, they've been to the playoff a few times. So, what I, what I, and I'll just reiterate, I don't want your non conference wow games going away in September. Just can't have it. Uh, some are mixed. Vic emails in Chris at HaleVarsity.com. He doesn't like the idea of a buy happening uh, for those four teams. But you need a little spice. You need a little variety, right? And more teams gives you that variety. And it could be slated throughout the bowl setup, those New Year's Day 6 and some other periphery bowl games. You could make it happen. I'm excited about it. Playoffs been fun. It's been good. You've had some great matchups and some. You've had more blowouts than great games, but you've also had Ohio State, Clemson the last couple of years that have been great games, and you've seen Alabama also get blown out two years ago by Clemson. Yeah, I, I think you really do need more people invited to the party. My my problem with the 12 team is that you're adding for any team that's going to be coming from like the, the bottom half is that's four more games on their schedule. After they have probably already lost a conference championship game, they've probably played their 12, lost conference championship game, 13. They're playing 17 games in a season. You're right. You're free bowl. You're at 13. 
So you're working up to an NFL type schedule. I mean, 17 games. I mean, for the Alabamas and the Clemsons, that's going to be year in, year out. Though they're going to be playing 16, 17 games, which is a lot of games. But at the, at the same time, <laughs> at the same time, this is probably what most of the players in the team want: is is that they don't mind playing more games because they love playing football. Or, or we think they're deep. Yeah, but I, I, I do worry about just guys getting hurt. I mean, because you're playing the, the cream of the crop in these games, and you're going to be playing them for four straight weeks. To Kaz's point, you know, if you're in a, a game of substance, you're not going to opt out. Mm-hmm. Likely. If you're, if you're in it for a, for, for a title run. But no, this, this has some equity. Gets you your automatic qualifiers, and you have your at-large. Uh, it means that the Central Floridas and Boises of the world can have more than just the the one shining moment against an Auburn. They are good programs. They're good football teams. They're one shining moment against Oklahoma with uh, giving OU a nice uh, sandwich full of Sooner Magic back to them. Talk to you tomorrow at 4. Thanks for spending time at Hale Varsity presented by the Nebraska Lottery.